Welcome to the Jill on Money Show. It is Monday, January 1st. It is 2024. I can't believe we got here. And we did. So much has happened in the last four years since I originally conducted an interview with Dan Pink. He is a best-selling author, and uh, four years ago, he wrote a book called When, The Scientific Secrets of Perfect Timing. And this was such a great interview. I remember when I actually conducted it, I took notes, and there were things in the book and in this interview that have stayed with me. Now, of course, they sort of faded amid COVID, but now we're beyond that, hopefully. And I think it's really a good time to resurrect this interview because it does feel like we're all resetting and going to a place where we can now think about what do we want to do in the future. If we can help you better manage some of the choices you're making and when you make those choices, well, you know what? I think that's great news. So this is the third part of our interview. If you haven't listened to the Saturday and Sunday show, go and listen to those, then come back to this. This is such a good way to start the brand new year. In this part of the interview, we're going to talk with Dan about why certain dates are important to timing and goal setting. Ah, perfect thing to do on New Year's Day, right? Okay, here is the third part, the last part of our interview with Dan Pink, again, from 2019, from four years ago. Why is the turn of a calendar? Why is Rosh Hashanah for Jews important? Why are these days, why are they become important in in terms of the timing of when you set goals? Yeah, it, they, um, they're, they're enormously important for a whole set of reasons because part of the science of timing is not only these daily patterns, but how do beginnings of any kind affect us? That's what we're talking about here. How do midpoints affect us? How do endings affect us? And there's some really, really beautiful, interesting research on what social psychologists call temporal landmarks. That's what you're talking about, temporal landmarks. And there's certain dates that stand out in time the way that physical landmarks stand out in space. So if I were directing somebody to my house in Washington, D.C., there's certain landmarks that I would tell them to look for to find my street. I'd have a, a smallish street. It's not one of the, but it's off of a really big street. And it's, anyway, it's, it's complicated because of Washington has certain streets that are on diagonals and certain streets that are parallel and I'm on a diagonal and it's small and blah, blah, blah. So my view is like, look for Cactus Cantina Restaurant. There you go. All right. Get and, a margarita and come over. So they see Cactus Cantina Restaurant and they, what do they do? They start slowing down, right. becoming more aware. And that's what happens with these temporal landmarks. But they also do something else. They trigger this very peculiar form of mental accounting. So uh, what we do on certain of these dates is that we essentially open up a fresh ledger on ourselves. So think about ledgers in the old days when they're made of paper. They're not spreadsheets. They're not uh, Young or people like listening, that. go Google ledger yeah, so you yeah. can see what we're talking they're about. They're actually kind of beautiful. Ledgers I know. I love beautiful them. in a way. I know. And, and so, so what you're doing is you're opening up a fresh ledger on yourself the way that a, bu- a small business 80 years ago would open up a fresh ledger on a new quarter or a new year. And you basically say, old me had a drink every day. New me reborn on the first day of January is going to be dry for the next 30 days. And so I think one of the interesting things about New Year's resolutions is that when you look at the numbers on New Year's resolutions, let's say the, the numbers are all over the place, but let's say that by February... Um, two-thirds of people are not keeping their New Year's resolutions. Mm-hmm. Let's just stipulate that that's the right thing. Okay. To me, it's like that's bearing the lead. To me, that says, wait a second, one-third of people are keeping their resolutions? That's pretty amazing when you think about how hard it is to change our behavior. Right. And so what this means, and this is some great research on what's called the fresh start effect done by uh, three researchers uh, at Penn, Katie Milkman, Heng Chen Dai, and uh, Jason Reese. And what they found is that Certain dates are fresh start dates, so we're more likely to start behavior change and therefore more likely to have a fighting chance of continuing it. So you're better off starting, uh, let's say, I'm finally going to go to the gym regularly. Start that on a Monday rather than on a Thursday. Start it on the first of the month rather than the 23rd of the month. Start it on the day after your birthday rather than four days before your birthday. And you say there are 86 chances to have fresh starts? There are all kinds of fresh starts. The first day, every Monday is in some ways a fresh start. Every first of the month is a fresh start. There are both um, personal and social uh, fresh start dates. So, so for so personal one would be like you know the day after my wedding anniversary, right? Mm-hmm. So that would be July third. Not a meaningful date for most people, but a meaningful date for me. 
um, the day after your birthday, the day after your kid was born, but also things that we share or things at small groups. So, so the Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah, that's a fresh start date. And actually, if you look at uh, what, what's interesting is that is that the way that certain religious traditions welcome in the New Year, it has all of the trappings of fresh start. Right? We announce it. We have we, we you know there's there's some talk sort of at least tangentially about a clean slate and starting over the first of the month. There's the first day after first day after spring for students, the first day of a semester. Um, so whatever. So there's certain in our religious traditions, there's their fresh start dates in our schools, their fresh start dates in our personal lives and just on our regular cal- shared calendar. All right. Now, let me just show you something I marked up in your book. Yes. Do you see <laughs> that? Do you see that midlife thing? Yes. Do you see where I what I circled there? Do you see what my age is? I'm right smack in the bottom 53, age 53, well-being slumps in midlife. Uh, wah, wah. I am 54, so I so feel you, your pain. We are there. Um, what is up with this? This is some really, really interesting research uh, based on two dimensions. First, we talk about this idea of a midlife crisis. That's complete bunk. There is no evidence of a midlife crisis. It's one of, it drives me nuts that people actually even use that term because there's zero evidence of that. But something else I think more interesting happens in midlife and is, is basically what, they, what researchers call a U-shaped curve of well-being. It's not a crisis. It doesn't, the bottom doesn't fall out, but there's a dip. And the dip is around, <laughs> in general, around our age. And the chart you're pointing to is a chart from uh, Angus Deaton, who's a Nobel Prize winning economist at Princeton. But the, the, the U-shaped curve of well-being that, that he and his team found is similar to what researchers around the world have found. This is not an American phenomenon. This is a international phenomenon. This U-shaped curve of well-being in midlife, that is, we're happier in our 20s and 30s, we'd be into dip in our 40s, really, you know, hit the, 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 the bottom of that gentle U in our 50s, and then generally start going back up, has been found in something like 70 countries. Hmm. If I were to show you that chart, and then say, if I were to show you that chart and not identify it, and then show you the chart of well-being over the lifespan in France, and then say, here's the well-being over the lifespan in uh, United Arab Emirates, you would not be able to tell the difference hmm. among those. Interesting. So, I mean, you you attribute this one possibility, the disappointment of unrealized expectations. So I would just say that, look, when I looked at this chart, I was fascinated by it because, first of all, there's a huge drop down uh-huh. um, as you get to be sort of like in your 20s. Yeah. And I think that a lot of kids in their 20s are like, I should be at the top of the world. Why don't I feel better? So I feel like it's like a nice explanation for like, you don't have to feel so good because you're learning a lot. But you know what? After going through two divorces, <laughs> I can tell you that like my well-being shifted because of those th- experiences early on. Sure. I'm wondering what your advice might be to navigate some if someone is sort of feeling that unrealized expectation or just feeling like, you know, my kids are out of school, out of my house. I've, I've lost my purpose. Maybe yeah. you were the stay at home parent yeah. or whatever. What is the advice for getting through the trough? It's a great it's a great question. And, and as you say, we're talking about large population samples. So people, not everybody, this is not like, um, um, oh, there's a, a cold front is meeting a warm front. Therefore, inevitably, it's going to rain. This is, you know, large populations and general patterns and everybody doesn't abide by it. But I think there are a few things that, 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 that people can do is, and, and we don't know the reason why, actually. We can speculate about that, but we don't know exactly the reason why. I think one thing to do, there are all kinds of things that we can do. One of them is... Um, gratitude. Uh, there is enormous, as you know, Julie, there's enormous research on gratitude. And so what you, can do, what you can do is you can say, well, you know, okay, I'm not the CEO, but what am I grateful for? Oh, I have a happy marriage. Oh, or I have these great friends. Or I'm in perfect physical health. Or poo poo poo. You would never say that out loud if what, you were Jewish. Whatever. And you challenge the gods whatever. to get you. But, but but you know, it's like what am what am what am I what am I what am I grateful for? There's there's actually this really really interesting technique built on a lot of research, which I which I really like. It's it's an interesting mental exercise called mental subtraction of positive events. And so what you do is you think about your life, something good that happened to you, and then you pretend it didn't happen. Oh, this is like uh, uh, the that Christmas it's movie. It's a wonderful, it's a wonderful life, right? Totally, yeah. totally. Um, that's a very important movie psychologically. So anyway, I'll leave that aside for now. The 
uh, so you mentally subtract a positive event. So let's say, I don't know, what's a positive event in the first 35 years of your life? Whatever. Like, uh, you know, that like I, I had a job, I had success, I had okay, nieces yeah. and nephews, whatever. Okay. Well, okay. So let's say you had a, you, you know, what, what you had a, you know, whatever your first great job in journalism was. Right. Imagine if that didn't happen. Right. You would not be, might not be here sitting with me. I'm, and that would be a, high, that would be a deep, deep disappointment. I'm already disappointed <laughs> considering that it could have happened that way. It's well, horrifying. but I think about, you know, I, I think about it, you know, I, I got, I got three kids. It's like, geez, like what if like one of my kids wasn't born? Oy. I know. It's like, uh, okay. Suddenly every niggling little irritation goes away. So I do it differently. And you also can wait. Here's the other thing is that, you know, if you're, if you're at the bottom of this, if you're at the bottom of this U-shaped curve of well-being, you know, some people, people who are the, ha- the glass half full type will say, mm. hey, you got nothing but up. That's right. Hey. I got my upside. Yeah. I, I, well, I mean, so I think that I look at it as when I'm starting to get wrapped up in something like somebody, you, you know, said something about the, you know, whatever changes going on at work. And, and uh, I looked at him and he was like all down and out and he's like so depressed. I'm like, dude, you get paid to be on TV. That's like kind of the greatest thing ever. Absolutely. And I said, I get paid and they do my hair and makeup. Perfect. I mean, really? I, I don't want to be Pollyanna-ish about Let's, this. Let's, come on. When we, when, when we think about this, and this is a challenge in the workplace, I think, is that when you, um, you, you have a lot of people who are in that period where they're less, slightly less happy with their lives. Less happy people in general are not as productive, don't do as, as great mm. work. And- I've always thought that one thing that we could be doing inside of organizations is mid-career mentoring. We do mentoring for people in their 20s. Why not do mentoring for people our age? Because, you know, it's like, okay, hey, you're, you're, you're a great contributor. You're not going to be CEO, but you're 53 years old. And I don't know, you might have 30 good working years in you, 30 years, 35 years of great contribution. It's like, let's help you find that path. Mentoring is such a great two-way street yeah, that when totally. I help someone out who's younger, I always find that I learn something either about myself or about that person or it's so, it feels quite nourishing. And I think that that's a wonderful thing. As we get older, speaking, speaking about beginning, yeah. middle, and end, yeah. There is a great deal of evidence that we tend to be happier. But then I was th- reading your book and thinking yeah. about all that other strain of research, which is older people are isolated and lonely and that. So bring that together for me. Well, I mean, I actually think that that the preponderance of evidence is that old age, older age is a much happier time than we realize. Uh, for for a couple of reasons, uh, and there's some great work done on this by Laura Carsonson at Stanford, uh, and she looked at uh, friendship networks and what we typically see in the size of people. Forget not 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 like Facebook, but like real friends. Yeah. Right? So if you look at the size of friendship networks, um, they they grow in the 20s, 30s, they grow, 40s, 50s, they grow, but around age 60 they start to drop. And sometimes significantly. And she was puzzled by that because that is superficially the story of isolation and despair and loneliness. And what she instead did is she, she unpacked that and she had the people, uh, as she examined their friendship network, she said, okay, divide people into groups. Inner circle, middle circle, outer circle. Inner circle, people you can't live without. Next circle out, people you really like. Next circle out, yeah, they're cool too. And what she found is that all of the decline was in the middle and outer circles. Hmm. That, and, and then in, in some instances, that inner circle actually grew a little bit because at the end, you know, toward the end, if you're like, say, in, you know, I'm in the final third of this book here, um, I got to get rid of some of these characters because they're boring me. They're not doing anything for me. And you're more, you're more willing to shed their, you're more willing to shed those friends because you focus on these things. And, and, and what we know is that intimate, Social connections is one of the things that makes us most satisfied. There's a, you know, there's a famous grant study uh, from Harvard where they, they had, the, it's all men, it's all white men, where they, they followed these men for decades and decades and decades. From the time they were undergraduates, they did another one of some working yeah. class people in Boston. And as you follow them through, it basically, like, who's happy and who's not? And Robert Waldinger, the, the Harvard guy who's running this program now, says, you know, it's basically... Happiness is love, full stop. That's it. You have people who you, you you have people who you care about. You have people who care about you. Boom. That's it. That's it. It ain't money. Oh, it's not money. It's not even and money is good. All right, and professional accomplishment is good, and making a contribution to the world is good. But 
at the center of it all is, do you have people you love and do you have people who love you? And that is a good way to end this interview. <laughs> Because I'll tell you something, that is, that is, it's true. That, it's, that's really what- It's empirically true. It, this is not like, I'm not preaching, you know, I'm not like, I don't have a philosophy about this. I'm basically, I'm, 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 I'm you know, you look at the evidence and the evidence tells us that's what it's all about. If you have a financial question, if you're ready to do some goal setting and it's the timing that seems right to you, give us a holler. Go to jillonmoney.com, click the contact us button. Let us know if you'd be willing to come on the air. Check out all the great content that lives on the website, including the free weekly newsletter, my book, The Great Money Reset, and our subscription service. That's called Jill on Money Live, where you have access to quarterly live webinars and lots of cool special bonus content. Don't forget, you can listen to this program on the Odyssey app or wherever you find your favorite podcasts. All right, so first day of the new year, I can't emphasize enough how important it is that you try to do something nice for someone else today, but also every day. This is like our little joint mantra together. We wanna do this, do something nice for someone else today, hold somebody, reach out. This is going to make you feel better. It's gonna get you out of your funk. I promise it's really worthwhile. And don't forget that we are always here for you. We've got our hands on your back. You put your hands on someone else's back, hold somebody. Change your work, change your wealth, change your life. Thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you tomorrow. Tomorrow.